Tripta Jipa, I now ask you to take the stage. Your Holiness, Your Eminences, Gante uh, Rinpoche and Kenjin Tongo um, distinguished participants, scholars, faculties, and students of uh, um, Central University of Tibetan Studies, and friends. Uh, I'm deeply honored to have this opportunity uh, to be part of this two-day historic uh, conference on mind in Indian philosophical schools of thought and modern science. Um, so at the beginning, I would like to express my deep appreciation to the university and Chancellor Gishela and Professor Prasdeep Gogal for inviting me and including me as part of the presenters here. Um, I um, feel a little uncomfortable step, stepping out of my traditional role as His Holiness's interpreter and speaking in my own voice, but I would like to seek your permission first. Uh, my presentation, unlike all the other speakers, is really not to His Holiness, but to my actually fellow uh, panelists and speakers and respondents. Um, what I would like to present is to add yet another piece of the jigsaw puzzle or the mosaic that is really the rich Indian philosophical tradition. Yesterday, we listened to um, a rich presentation of the very profound ideas from different Indian traditions, starting from Samkhya, Adivadi Vedanta, Nyaya, and Jain. And this morning, we were treated to a wonderful presentation on the Theravada uh, understanding of the concept of mind, and then followed by uh, Professor Bitbol's uh, beautiful presentation, particularly from the uh, perspective of Erwin Schrodinger. Um, what I would like to do is um, really add one more piece, this time from the Indian uh, Buddhist philosophical schools of thought. I wouldn't call it Mahayana tradition because Mahayana is such a broad tradition. And I'll be in fact focusing specifically not just on one system of thought, which is the Buddhist Pramana tradition, a Tema tradition, but in fact on one thinker, Dignag, um, who is a fifth century great Indian uh, philosopher. Um, my presentation is divided into two parts. The first part is a little bit more technical, so I'll you know, ask your patience, uh, which is looking specifically at Dignaga's two arguments um, for, the present, for making the case for what I call um, you know, dual-aspected character of consciousness, lo chunyi. And in the second part, my idea, my attempt would be to extrapolate what we can learn from Dignagas, this particular idea, and see whether we have some important lessons and insights for the general quest, the contemporary quest for understanding what consciousness is. Um, so, at the beginning, you know, yesterday, you know, we were reminded by Professor Pratip Gogel about being careful about what we mean by the different terms when we use the word mind, consciousness, and so on. And um, this, this morning, Professor Tilak Ratna also, uh, you know, beautifully explained how the three terms in the Buddhist tradition, citta, manas, and vijnana, uh, sim, yi, um, and namshe, uh, mind, which we translate as mind and mental faculty, and consciousness are used. Um, so what is that phenomenon that we are talking about? And I have one quote from the, uh, one of the Mahayana Sutras, very well known, and this can be taken from many other similar Mahayana texts. And here, the, and this gives you a general idea of what we are talking about when we are talking about mind or consciousness in the Buddhist Mahayana uh, schools. Um, I read the quote, the mind has no material form it is not demonstrable, has no appearance, no resistance, no fixed locus or special locus, and cannot be perceived by other senses. So we can see that although you know, Buddhism, I wouldn't characterize as being dualistic, 
But when it comes to defining what consciousness and mind is, you know, it tends to do by contrasting. So unlike, you know, mind, there is um, material things, there is no material form and so on. So this, you can get a sense of there is an idea that we are talking about something that has no extension, something that has no form, something that has no fixed spatial location, and something that cannot be perceived by others directly. Uh, so those are characteristics. So let me now go to Dignaga's uh, argument. And in fact, to give a context, uh, Dignaga is making this case in the context of analyzing a simple act of cognition. You know, yesterday in a Naya presentation, we were, you know, um, uh, explained that uh, the act of cognition can be described in terms of an agent, an act, an actor, and so on. Uh, here, Dignag is trying to ex give the, his own account of this. So, and he calls it divirupa, uh, uh, So this is, uh, and I translate in English as a dual aspect character of consciousness. Um, Dignaga provides two arguments. Um, and of course, Dharmakirti, his brilliant commentator, you know, develops on, on this and also add, brings a lot more new uh, reasoning for this. But the, the first argument is quite interesting and um, it's, I will just read it. If you compare the structure of the recollection of seeing blue with the actual experience itself of seeing blue, he says that the former, the recollection, has a double aspect. It has the object perceived, the aspect of the object perceived, as well as the experiencing of that object, because it is the recollection of seeing blue. It's not the, just the perception of the blue. All subsequent recollections, so the remember, recollection of the recollection, recollection of the recollections, and so on, he says that uh, an additional, all subsequent recollections, remembering of remembering, each will thus acquire one additional aspect, which is akar, you know, as if viewed through a layers of filter until the chain ends. So you can see that every time a new aspect comes up. Therefore, cognitions possess an objective aspect, suen number, grahakara, grahakara, as well as subjective aspect, zimbe number. Otherwise, cognition of the object and cognition of its cognition would be indistinguishable. So he makes the distinction that the fact that you can have multiple aspects as you have more and more layers of recollection is an indication that there is an objective aspect you know, that is imprinted to the perception when you first see this blue object in front of you. Yushepa da Teshepa. So this is uh, Pramana Samuchaya, which exists only in Tibetan, both the root text as well as the, the auto-commentary. So this is ver uh, chapter 1, 11, 1, A, B. The second argument um, again uses memory and it says that in fact that in our recollections of past experiences we are able to distinguish between different perceptions of seeing a form as opposed to hearing a sound and so on indicates that our experience have dual dimensions, an objective one and a subjective one. Not only are we able to remember the specific object experience but we are also able to remember the modality of that experience. When you remember, you, see, you remember seeing something, you remember hearing something. So he says that unless there are two aspects to the experience itself, you cannot have these distinctions in your memory. So he's using, this is verse um, 11c. And then he says, furthermore, he says that through this reasoning of memory, one thing that also suggests is that the consciousness is reflexive. Consciousness must know itself. So he says that this memory argument implies that consciousness is reflexive, svasamviti, mem because memory requires a prior existence, a prior, prior perception, uh, as well as the perceiving of that object. To have such a recollection of the subjective side of experience, that of seeing the object, there is no need for an additional second order to subsequent cognition to be present. This indicates that the original experience itself has reflexive dimension. So, and the, the reasoning is simply the following. The subject, the perception of blue, the perceiving blue, must have a prior experience, because when you remember seeing blue, you also remember not just the blue that you have seen, but also you remember seeing it. 
So there's uh, memory has both subjective dimension as well as objective dimension. So, so this, of course, is a controversial within the Buddhist schools. Many other schools, Buddhist traditions reject this, and particularly a strong reflexive thesis. So the key points of this particular reflexive awareness thesis is that it says the consciousness is self-presencing, self-luminous, inherently reflexive. And if, because if it is not itself luminous, then it wouldn't have the capacity of illuminating others like objects. The second point is that this reflexive awareness is not a separate cognitive strand. It's an essential feature of the experience itself. That's, a, that's another important point. And, and the way in which the consciousness is aware of itself is not in a subject-object you know, uh, way, but in an uh, intransitive way. You know, uh, so this I think is an important point. It's a so I'm going to skip the next one because for sake of time. Now to move to the next part of my talk. So from this, my now this is of course my my own opinion. I believe that looking at this very small section of Dignaga's idea we can see a suggestion of a basic structure of consciousness. A basic structure of consciousness, he's arguing, seems to have three aspects. One is the intentional aspect, which is the object in front of you. There's an object directedness. It's conscious about something, consciousness about something. The other one is the subjective dimension, which is the experience itself. You know, what primary character of consciousness is the experience itself. And then there is the reflexive dimension, which is the mind's ability to reflect upon itself or know itself. And so we can extrapolate these three and really come up with a suggestion that these are in fact suggest a structure of consciousness. So to go more specifically, um, intentionality is of course a Western phenomenology term, but we, it works really well with the Buddhist idea and Dharma Kirti has this line which says, um, uh, the apprehension of an object is the defining characteristic of consciousness. So that really is exactly the idea of intentionality as expressed in Western thought. For example, uh, Franz Brantano, who was a German philosopher who had influenced phenomenology extensively, he writes, every mental phenomena is characterized by what the scholastic of Middle Ages called intentional, in existence of an object, and what we would call, although not entirely in unambiguous terms, the reference to a content, a direction upon an object by which we are not to understand the reality in this case, or an imminent objectivity. So he's basically saying intentionality relates to the content of that experience. Uh, and that idea is really very similar to Dham Dharmakirti's line where he says that uh, apprehension of an object is the characteristic of consciousness. Subjectivity is basically the phenomenal first-person character of our mental life. Whether it is thoughts, whether it is perceptions, whether it is sensations, they are all from the perspective of an individual experiencing them. There is that irreducible first-person character. And here, this has been a major interest in contemporary Western thought, and particularly triggered by an influential paper written in 1974 by Thomas Nagel, which was a very short paper, and it's called, What Does It Feel Like to Be a Bat? And really captures that difficulty of reducing the, you know, the, the subjectivity that is the defining feature of... Um... Now, reflexivity is a bit more complicated um, you know, thesis, and of course, as you know, Jay Graffel, he's a, a, a major critique of this reflexivity thesis. But um, I would actually suggest we make distinction between two forms of this, a strong thesis and a moderate thesis. The strong thesis is the one that Dignaga has presented, where consciousness is aware of itself in a non-dualistic manner, and there is no subject-object character. And this is very powerfully captured in um, Shantarakshita's line where he says that nature of consciousness is reflexive awareness 
and that which is not reflexively awareness is insentient. Namche pembe rang shin le dogba karsa dogba rap to kewa de. Thi karsa pembe rang shin kain ba thi di dani she ba. So that line, he basically, and then he goes on to say that there is no subject-object dimension to this experience. It's non-dual. Now, I would suggest there is also a moderate thesis. Here I'm looking at you, where one could accept reflexivity, but not in this very strict sense, but in the general idea that mind, unlike matter, has a capacity to reflect upon itself. And if we take the moderate thesis, then any account of consciousness will have to explain that. So to conclude, I would... Um, so my contention is that looking at Dignaga, we really have the beginnings of a suggestion of a basic structure of cognition or consciousness which includes these three features, the intentionality, that is object directedness or content related, subjectivity, which is the experience itself, and then reflexivity, which is the mind's capacity to know itself. And together, they provide some idea of what is a basic structure of consciousness. I'm not talking about specific, I'm talking in general sense. Then, Although Dignaga's own formulations is based on the concept of akar, aspect, number, and also reflexive awareness, svasamvit, you know, both of which have been, you know, rejected and critiqued. For example, like the Buddhist school, uh, Vaibhashika does not accept akar theory. It's a nirkara, nirkara vatin. Similarly, Nyaya and uh, um, also Jain and Memamsakas don't accept Akar uh, theory. Um, similarly, the Svasamvit, the strong reflexivity thesis is rejected by, you know, Buddhist schools like, uh, you know, uh, Chantrakirti and Shantideva and so on. Um, but I don't think accepting these three features as a constitutive of consciousness requires buying into the specifics of Dignaga's theory. Um, and therefore, I would argue that any comprehensive theory of consciousness must account for these three features that make up what we call mind or consciousness. Thank you very much, Jim Pala. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim Pala. Your Holiness, may I ask you to offer some remarks before we close the session? Chalon <laughs> ジリンデザネタジブデンドシェアデレヤタシソンデイエメディンジベタチェジブデイエメディンロンリクサマゴレスタタディガンデゴレジャザンガシェバレヤカチデシンリエネジノミヤンガワロンリタロンリクドヤ
Zibut in Russian, Shimbina, Karsane, Tidu Didi, the Shevez, the Shevez, Shevez, Shashero, the Shevet in Russia, Zane, Teria, Atak, the British Shubush language. So um, I'm translating for His Holiness here. Um, of course, the great masters like Dignaga and Dharmakirti were uh, amazing epistemologists, Brahmana scholars. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and you can see that through their you know, writings that how deep thinkers they were. Uh, but from an ontological standpoint, and they uh, subscribed to the view of non-duality of subject and object uh, and rejected the reality of external uh, physical objects. So in this way, um, they subscribed to the view that uh, consciousness is more ultimate than uh, of material entity. And so one needs to understand one of the reasons why they posit this very strong reflexive awareness thesis because the denial of object, external object, is grounded upon this understanding of the mind. And then how do you ground the reality of the mind? The grounding of the reality of mind is, mind is you know, based on this idea of self-reflexivity which is you know, uh, non-conceptual. So there's a self-luminosity of the mind is what grounds the ultimate reality of consciousness. So this is the reason why uh, the Savasamvit concept was critiqued by other Buddhists who reject any notion of objectivity or ultimacy, whether to mind or objects. So for example, those masters who reject the notion of uh, intrinsic existence, even on the conventional level, for them, there is no point in prioritizing the reality of object and subject. Just as objects are conventionally real, just as the subjects are conventionally real, objects are also conventionally real, just as in the ultimate sense, object cannot be found as having intrinsic existence, similarly, the subjects will not be found to have so there is no point in making that kind of a hierarchical distinction. And these masters will therefore take uh, to task the idea of this Sawasamvit, which seems to underpin the belief in some kind of ultimacy of the consciousness. So those contexts need to be understood. Thank you very much, Your Holiness. Um, oh. Any? Oh, umoba. あの、ちゅうそうだな、全部。あの、谷へと言うやん。だって全然逃げめだわ。もう逃げめば。めんやん。あと、ディスメグンがね、シャワイな。あと、途中で、あの、シャワイで、あの、シャワイで、あの、シ
Thank you very much, Your Holiness, for these wonderful remarks and for contributing so much to this conference and for defending me against Jimpala. Um, <laughs> and thank you, Jimpa, for a really terrific, um, ter terrific presentation. It's always good to argue with you. Um, and thank, please join me in thanking the entire panel this morning. So far, we've had a really great morning. It's time for a little bit of a break. Um, thank you, all of you. All of you. And, and once again, um, as we celebrate the tremendous success of the Central University of Tibetan Studies, let's remember that part of that success is its constant um, encouragement of the spirit of dialogue and discussion and openness, and to use this as an opportunity not only to celebrate, but to rededicate ourselves to that spirit of dialogue. Thank you. <laughs>